Welcome to the Doctor Who 1960s Retrospective, exploring episodes from 1965 to 1967. Sit back on a journey of the past, fasten your seatbelts as you visit the past and adventures in the classic BBC long-running science fiction series of Doctor Who. Welcome to the Literary Licence Podcast. Tonight we're reviewing The Web Planet from 1965 and The Crusade, the missing episodes. Uh, and then we're going to be, that will be followed by the 1965 um, TV movie Doctor Who and the Daleks. Um, I'm joined with uh, Ramona. Hi, Ramona. Hello. And Matthew Rose. Good evening. It's good to be back. And Marios. Hi, everybody. <laughs> and David. Hello. <laughs> and myself, Craig. So I'll open the floor to uh, the web planet. And we'll just skip to the plot and we'll be right back. synopsis for Doctor Who, The Web Planet. The TARDIS is forced to land on a planet which the first Doctor recognizes as Zorchus, but he is puzzled by the presence of several moons around the normally moonless planet. A force acting through Barbara Wright's gold bracelet draws her outside, leaving Vicky alone. The TARDIS is pulled by an unseen force across the planet's surface. Barbara is drawn into a trio of the butterfly-like Mentropra, who free her of the trance by removing the bracelet. She escapes but is captured by the ant-like Zarbi, who uses her to find the Mentopra. The Zarbi takes Barbara and Frostrar, a Mentopra, to the crater of the Needles to drop vegetation into the acid rivers which feed the Emnus. The Zarbi take the Doctor and Ian Charleston to the Carcinome, where they find Vicky and the TARDIS. The Animus forces the Doctor to help track down the Mentopra invasion force. Ian escapes and meets a Mentropra called Vrestra. He learns the Mentropra and the Zarbi are native to the planet. The Animus is taking control of the planet and the Mentropra have fled to one of the moons that the Animus has pulled into orbit. The Doctor accidentally reveals the Mentropra's spearhead plan to land near the crater of Needles, giving the Animus the opportunity to ambush them. Ian and Zvestrin meet the Aptra, descendants of the Metropra, who fled underground and convinced them to help fight the Animus, digging upwards beneath the Carcinomai. At the Crater of Needles, Barbara and Haustra failed to, in their attempt to warn the Metropra and the Spearhead is massacred. The Doctor deduces that the Animus uses gold to channel its mesmerizing force and it counteracts it to control a Zarbi and escape with Vicky. They meet Barbara and the Metropra and devise a plan to attack the Carcinomai, the Doctor and Vicky are taken by the Zarpi to the Animus, a great spider-like creature. Barbara and the Metropra attack the Carcinome from outside while Ian, Vestrin, and the Opatra re reach the Animus from below. They defeat the Animus with the Isotope, a, a cell-destroying weapon devised by the Metropra. The Zarpi return to the docile state and the planet turns to its pure state. The Doctor and his companions leave in the TARDIS, and the creatures of Vortis promise to tell stories of their saviors. And that was the synopsis for The Wet Planet from Doctor Who from 1965. Hello and welcome back to the Literary Licence Podcast. Tonight we're reviewing The Web Planet. And the floor's open, guys. So what do you think? Well, it was six episodes, this one. And I think for me, it actually scared me, to be honest. <laughs> I was, yeah, I know people think, say to me, why did it scare you? Why did it scare you? Well, I'll tell you why it scared me. The Zabi scared me. <laughs> <laughs> and Barbara's hypnotic state scared me. It was freaky. The way she was walking all the way around like this. 
And yeah, and I was going, no, please, I need to hide behind the, my sofa again, you know, but <laughs> it was really good. And honestly, I'm seeing double vision here. I don't know if anybody else agrees, but Vicky, I'm sorry, is Susan number two. I don't mm. know if anyone else could um, vouch for me on that one. Anybody takers? Any takers on it? I don't know. But for me, I'm thinking for season number two. But it was a very, it's a very good story. Very scary, but very good story, I think. Yeah. Yeah, but, just on that note, Marius, I still think that was part of the stuff that was written for Carol Ann just before she did the whole leaving. Mm. So it probably was all in production before the decision came she was going. Yeah, I mean, I understand that because I know that further on um, within the production notes and things like that, um, the actress, more, is it Maureen O'Brien? Please tell yes. me. Yes, yeah, Maureen, said, yeah. Yeah, she said, do you want Carol Ann Ford back or do you want me? Which one is it? I think, I think that happened later on with Galaxy 4 uh, too. But um, I think it's the way that they're, they're trying to get her characterization, which I think... It, a bit more within the story, I think, too, is trying to write for her because it's, it's, it's still early stages, isn't it? Isn't it still with her role in the story? Mm. I think. Yes. I've always been told Vicky was more of a well developed version of Susan. That's why more people seem to lean to her out of like the two that travel with the doctor out of them two because he leans more of like the granddaughter side with them. I'm further on uh, with Dodo because I've gone back and done her stuff as well. And they've been seen with the fir first Doctor as like sort of the three granddaughters to him. Not that they actually were apart from Susan, but it's in the show wanted to continue that. And that's why they did it with stuff like the Web Planet. Like they wanted a surrogate replacement for Carol Ann. Mm. And I love the relationship between um, the first Doctor and the King, I think, because he's trying to mould her as well, I believe, as well as Barbara and Ian are trying to do the same to make her in more independent as they go as the story goes on. It's a bit like Susan as well. They tried with her, but obviously she seemed still quite fearful on television. Where Vicky just talked to her to like a duck to water, and all the lost stuff with Dodo, she talked to her instantly. So it's like they've learned their mistakes with Susan, and we're trying to deal with it the show does so I felt with Web Planet. And I love the fact that um she um used the TARDIS as well. She was going for it with the TARDIS, Ricky. She was going there and she was controlling. It was amazing. Uh, I thought that was yeah. excellent. Yes, I love the cliffhanger of episode one. When the doctor's like my ship is so petrified. Like who on earth has stolen it thinking it's the Zabi, the Monotra and it's just Vicky just trying to get out of there. Ramona, what do you think? I like the uh, um, useless and useful treasure point or aspect. Uh, you you uh, take the doctor's ring as being a useful treasure to work the electric eye on the TARDIS to open the door. You look at gold. How man values gold and how the Zarbi used gold to control the humans and the doctor. It's interesting. It's like, it's like uh, King Midas, you know, you know, when he says uh, he's given the gift to sort of turn everything to gold because he's crazy about gold. So the palace becomes gold, the furniture becomes gold. Then he tries to eat something and that becomes gold. From the Midas touch. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, don't always wish for, don't wish for something because it might come true. What about the lovely butterfly people and the ant people yeah. and the... The woodlouse people. Well, um, <clears throat> well, go, you know, I, I love the uh, Minatra. The uh, BBC, they're operating basically on a shoestring budget for Doctor Who. A couple of shower curtains and some gaffers tape, and you got a costume. Oh, yeah, they were so yes. cute. Well, they wouldn't release yeah. the... They were supposed to release the... the, um, the, uh, the, the creatures as an eagle moss... Um, figure but they couldn't do the wings they said the wings were too delicate so they scrapped it but then i was thinking why couldn't they just do the wings when they were like down sort of at the back yeah 
and, and moulded them that way. I don't know why they moulded <laughs> them out. Apparently they wanted to do both, like for the collector set where you get on both up and down. That's probably mm. why they scrapped it because it would have been a logistical nightmare. Yeah. Mm. I want all the figures to come out from that series, just like one of those like six inch models ones, like you see now with the 13th Doctor and mm. everybody else. I think that would be just so cool. With, like, mm. the- I I always thought with the collection set, sorry to, sorry to be interesting, I always thought when they were doing them, that would have been a great exclusive, like even with Eagle Moss over, like to put like one classic figure in it. Like, even if it's Monoptra, even if it's stuff that wasn't released, it's stuff you would still get out in the wild. Mm. I think it would be really cool. It's a beautiful costume. The the, the wings and everything, such such good detail. Um, mm. A big, giant communist bladder that controls everything, you know? <laughs> and um, It's a bit like... Um... I think it must have been on acid, though. Well, it, it was, it was a bit like the Magic Roundabout. It was the 60s, like, in an... Um... I was still at school. Like, I'd like to know what drugs they were taking. At you know, the time. they could have gone down to Carnival, got loads of weird yeah. stuff down there, like, uh, you know, Organo and uh, weird coloured cellophane, you know? I'm mm. sure. <laughs> yeah. Mm. But I, I do love the story of the web planet because it's beautiful, it's haunting, it's dark. I think the people who don't like it are just got sensory overload from like the sounds, like the zombie make, like all the clicking. I know that's a distraction for people. For the um, that scared me. Yeah, I, I yeah, I, I've seen concerns about it over the years, and people have called it one of the weakest stories. But to me, I think it's a strong like continuation of Vicky's story. It's the development of she was lost, she was found, and she's found a new family in the Doctor Ian and Barbara. Um, so th- I can see what about an hour on, uh, on the. I know on the camera, <laughs> I, know. I, know, I know on the cameras they use Vaseline for the effects. On yeah, on, on the, the on the optical glass. Okay. Um, Good. Yeah, but I think what's was... beautiful. Sorry, I think also Craig, what's beautiful. Sorry, it was just because the moment's phone had gone off, it was just about to finish. Um, I think uh, what was so beautiful about the story is it's a minimal cast. Is it could be seen as too long, perhaps, but it's wonderful. You can pace it well in your own time, and you could tell the crew were just. Filling that void of Caroline's departure, you could see in their faces they're still getting used to Maureen, but they're taking their time with her. And that's the great thing with Web Planet. It's not the villains that are the true part of the story. It's coming to learn the grips of like this new family that have found each other after the rescue. Yeah. What I liked is that they showed some of the history of the Web Planet that the Monoptra were actually, that's where they came from. That is their home. The Temple of Light, uh, pyramids, mm. and uh, the drawings on the walls that, that showed their gods, that was them. Yes, it's a it's, bit like the Silurians okay. and the Sea de- It's a bit like the Silurians and Sea Devils. They were the original owners of the Earth, but obviously they got kicked out. So it's a bit like the Zabia Minotra. You had mm. one who came there first. And then you had the others that are fighting for dominance, which is just a wonderful thing that you don't get often with Doctor Who. Like, who was their first kind of ordeal? That's kind of pushed away for the romantic side of companions these days. What makes the TARDIS work in this as well is interesting as a, as a, for continuity. Um, you know, the fact that um, it was able to mesmerize the Zabi, you know, that was interesting. Not only that, but she got pissed. The uh, the TARDIS was not happy. Yeah. Uh she, she <laughs> we we saw that her console could spin mm. and uh you know react to what was going mm. on. And me on the science side was thinking that there was might be a quite a bit of gold underneath the hood there. <laughs> I think, as I say, this is beautiful. This is before the isomorphic controls came in. You can see, like, anyone was allowed to fly the TARDIS back then. It's wonderful to see the long journey now and then of, like, this stuff going on. What is great is seeing Vicky having that whole control of the TARDIS. And then you just you just see her trying so hard to get back to, like, where she was. It's 
it's a fun story, as I say. It's great because it's a small cast because you're instantly focusing on the Doctor and company build their relationship. And the only other cast, really, are the people in costumes. That's the great part of the story. You're not losing where who's the main villain, who's this. You're not having a maniac take over the world. It's just people who want to either live equally or have their home world back. Mm. Well, don't forget, we learned in The Brink of Disaster that the TARDIS can telepathically communicate with the companions. And if she likes you and needs you to fly her or flip a switch, she'll uh, give you that little message at the back of your hypothalamus there. And yeah, which, has become a, fly. Which, which has become a huge part of New Who now when the companions try to fly her. So, and if she really likes you, she'll let you take control like River. Yep. Mm. And because Donna, well, but again, Donna, <laughs> she did it with the meta, with the meta crisis. Doctor. Animus was pulling the TARDIS to the Vortis. Yeah. But isn't that sort of fun? And that's when the Doctor said, "Oh, they're gonna, it's gonna pull us from our astral plane." Yeah, but isn't the isn't that sort of um, the Animus? Isn't that something from Freud? Something to do with the I'm id? Not sure. Or... I, I might be going off the track here, like, but it sounds like a, you know, you got the id, ego. The first the episode ego. had 13.6 million viewers. Wow, that's you know, great. That, that really is a 16 minds think alike, Craig. I was just about to say that. Like, <laughs> I mean, there was, when, when it when it was released, there was a Radio Times cover. Yeah. Um, And I think it, it went into a lot of detail as well at the time. I think it gave half the plot away at the time as well. Mm. Um, yeah. I mean, the ratings, it was really good. It was, like you said, 13.5 for the first episode, 12.5 for the second, 12.5 again, then 13.0, 12.0, and then 11.5. Mm. I think what had helped back then, it was such an established crew still with the Doctor, Ian and Barbara, so people still had that familiarity. It was just coming to know young Vicky in the midst of it. I've read over the years, Maureen, Loved her time, but obviously they had to keep fighting with the scripts of her when it was even with Peter Purvis later on because they mm. kept trying to push her back to the Susan type, which she didn't sign up for or she would have walked away. So it's interesting, even though people say, Oh, New Who has its his issues with certain showrunners, Classic Who had loads of issues from the very beginning with all this stuff, how they treated companions. And it shows further on within the series with some of them. As well, from what we're going to be watching. Yeah, like I said, I read Peter Purvis Despised Galaxy 4 because um, they've written it for Barbara. The writer wasn't told any of that for his part. And they still wrote, um, was it, um, I'm trying to remember, Galaxy, it's Vicky. They tried to write her as Susan again because they'd all left and the writer wasn't informed. So, let's go back to Web Planet. Would I change, what would, um, what, what can I say? It's it's well done. It's it does exactly what it says on the tin. Is it a bit long winded? Yes, it can feel like it, but I just think it's the charm of the story. It's nostalgic. It's it's another. I'd say it was another demo for Doctor Who back in the early days to try a horror style, which we're quite familiar with the show now, which they weren't really. I mean, they did it as early as the Daleks, but then they kept pushing away uh, on and off and that stuff. But it can be seen as like a horror what, like watching this episode. I, I found this VHS copy of parts one and two in a little v VHS shop in one of the side streets in Soho, um, going back to around 2001. And it was such a gem. I found it. Mm. And they were just a couple of quid each. And then... I was I was so excited that I found that and the Daleks parts one and two, and I said to my friend Liz, I said, "Oh my god, I found it!" And then he's then the man behind the counter started having a go at his wife, saying, "I told you these were worth a lot more money, money." <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, didn't I mean, I found it as well. I think it was really, really haunting story for me. Anyway, um, mm. way this in within the setting on the planet Zabi, uh, it was really haunting. Team, the characters as well were really well devised in, in there too. Yeah, I mean, I thought it was long for me. It was a bit long for me. I it think was it a bit long for me also. Yeah. But that length of time allowed for character building and mm. relationship building so that we could have the depth 
and the death passage of one of the characters, beloved characters. And that's what and I love about that. That really that. hit me. That hit and me. Also, and that's the great thing going back into the Hartnell era. I haven't seen this since I watched it earlier the year, but going back into this early time for them, it's great how the early adventures are more about world building, coming to learn the crew or their story. That makes up for like when it's shoddy sets or whatever people kept going on about the wobbly stuff and when the villains weren't so great. It's the characters that make the stories of Doctor Who. And yeah, Vicky, it's early doors for poor Maureen at this point. But as she goes on, she really comes into her own. And I can see why loads of people adore her as Vicky as it went on. And he, and Vicky, talk, talking of um, character building, um, you know, we learn that Vicky's from the 25th century um, and she's saying that she she sees that the medication that they take is medieval almost. And <laughs> she says, you know, you'd, you'd need um, a certificate of education in, in, um, in medicine and in physics pharmacy. to get your <laughs> dosages. Um, which And then she describes it as t- almost like torturous. That was that was quite interesting. I, I I think her character's much more developing as well. We're getting to know who she is. Um, I have a question, and that was that uh, the doctor's first aid kit, uh, even though later on uh, into the next incarnation, we learn that the doctor is allergic to aspirin. He has aspirin in his <laughs> first aid kit. Mm. <laughs> it's uh, it, it's probably for emergencies only. Yeah, and I loved Ian's attire as well. In in this, his jacket, his um, jumper, and, and you know the way his look. I liked his look in this. No, <laughs> do we know why the Minoptera evacuated Vortis though? I don't think it's quite known, but what was great was it was hinting the Doctor was aware of this planet. It's probably one of the journeys he had with Susan before, like they came to Earth. So it seems he was very familiar with the planet. So that history might begin. That could be something they had planned to resolve in a sequel or another story, but obviously budget and timing for everything. Mm -hmm. But no, I can't recall if there was a history about why they evacuated, but that means they could turn it into a story one day if they wanted to. That would be amazing. That would be so cool. Bigfinish.com. I think they did that. I think they've got returned to the web planet. So when I re listen to it, I shall um, give you that. That's with five and Nissa. But <laughs> yes, as regards with the Minotra, I you see, I think this probably was um, declared as one of the most iconic things. That's why it got um, one of the strongest memories of Hartnell's granddaughter when they did adventure in space and time, when they brought up like uh, the Minotra with the butterfly people because oh, yeah. it stuck out it stuck out to kids probably finding it terrifying and beautiful back then because yeah. that's all they had for like back in the 60s. Yeah. Anybody wait for a dance number from the Zarbi? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I think I think Nick Briggs should get CGI or do something at Big Finish and someone animates it to life of tap dancing Zarbi. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And bring out the seaweed. And bring out the seaweed. Uh, just a little note here. It said 15 bags of seaweed from Cornish, from Corn, from Cornwall were requested as present. Oh my god! Under the hot lights, it was the stunk. <laughs> I know Pete. Mc, I know Pete McTighe did that beautiful like collection trailer with Maureen. Ever. What they should have done at the end was after she left, a dancing Zabi should have came on screen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I want a cuddly toy of them of a matraka. I want a cuddly toy of them. <laughs> I think if they co- I think if they came out to New Who now, I think if they kept that practic- um, the practical stuff that made them what they were, but a little bit of CG, I think it would work well in today's setting to bring them back. Maybe. Oh, William Hartnell was not well during the filming as well, again. No, that was when it started. Yeah. It started getting ill. Yeah. Mm. Yes, so they basically had to look after him. This is where it started to change for him. Was when Maureen joined. This when his health started to go. Oh. How how old was William Hartnell when he played Doctor Who? He was in his fifties. Okay, so he wasn't really that old, you know. No, but he passed. I mean, literally when the after the three Doctors when the final episode aired a couple of weeks later he passed. 
no, no. Yeah, yeah. He was he the oldest doctor then? I mean, um, the oldest doctor. No, he was uh, fifty odd. They've all been older than him. David Bradley, who took over for him, is literally eighty odd now. So he's mm. eighty odd playing the first doctor. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. What about ratings then? Mm. In terms of a story, if you're coming into Classic Who with the assumption, I know it's been a while since I've been here. I think the last one I was on was Susan. And I know um, a few bits have changed since then. But for Doctor Who, it's a solid story. It gets stretched to the part. Is it a bit long? Yes. But ratings wise, I'll give it a, sol- a solid, a monotron. Eight out, eight point five out of ten. It's you can't fault it. It's it's a great story, but it, is it like the depth of like later stuff like Tenth Planet stuff like War Games? No, but it's just a fun story to enjoy if you've got over an hour to spend. I love the haunting. I love the costumes. I love. I do. I do like the story, but for me, it was too long, and I think I will give it a seven out of ten. I'm going to give it a 9 out of 10. It was a bit long, but I loved the whole thing. And David? Yeah, well, I, I, I remember the zombies, and I remember seeing it in black and white. And just for that, I think it's got to have a 9. <laughs> yeah. And I think going back to what Matt was talking about, I would say this is, it reminds me of the Silurians slash the Mutants, because it was just enough episodes to get, to really get the meat on the story and mm. the world and appreciate that. And that, there wasn't too many questions left unanswered and it's just a brilliant piece. Um, I'd love them to come back in the new series. Yeah. It would be really weird and cool. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm going to give it a nine out of 10. Tonight we are reviewing the missing episode of the Doctor Who serial, The Crusade, from 1965. So um, I'm joined with um, Matthew Rose. What have you been up to, Matthew? Uh, hello, and it's good to be back. Yes, uh, hello. Uh, uh, what haven't I been up to? I've been busy for the last couple of months. That's why I vanished at the TARDIS and I've I reappeared. I know. Oh, it's nothing personal. Every time We're I keep glad coming to have home, you back. Yeah, every time I keep coming home, it just hasn't worked out. Am I going to be on here? Yeah, I'm all ready to go. There's suddenly I'm dragged from the ends of the universe, from Harbour Market to literally off to Scotland tomorrow for holiday. Mm-hmm. I'm also up for an award at the minute. I've been nominated for a Prince's Trust Award. So uh, mm-hmm. out of 100 people, and if I win, I get to go to Buckingham Palace. Wow, that's cool. <laughs> so uh, we're getting to it, King Charles. So I was just with Davros, um, K9, and a few other people yesterday. So I might be meeting Charles next year. It's no biggie for me. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, I mean, acting royalty, and now I get to meet actual royalty if I win. <laughs> cool. <laughs> yeah, so, no, I'm not going for an MBE or any anything like that. I uh, that I've checked, but... I've just been binging Big Finish. I've been watching the missing stories on like the telly snaps and listening to the audio versions of them. I really have been getting more sunk into like all the lost part of history. Currently, I've been on before this. I was on the Celestial Toy Maker, but I'm going to redo it on the train tomorrow. Cool. Mm. But it's been uh, yes, it's busy, and I'm friends with Zippy. Oh, that rhymed. <laughs> <laughs> and how about yourself, Ramona? What have you been up to? Um, I'm Ramona Snitcher from Hartford, Connecticut, and I'm packing for a move. Oh. Just cross town. 
but uh, things are expensive. <laughs> <laughs> Moving is stressful. Oh. And what about you, David? Yeah, well, I'm sort of uh, still doing my open mic nights in East Finchley and uh, trying out a couple of new songs. Actually got finally finished off 15 new songs, which I'm hoping to record maybe at the end of the year. And Craig's going to do some voiceovers. I'm going to uh, twist his arm. <laughs> it might even be the master of ceremony on this little uh, little idea. You know? So the master. You can be the oh. master. <laughs> Not the I'm master debater. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> now is he the master okay, that you must obey, or the master debater? Away, oh, never mind. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <I'll be able. laughs> you know? well, still play with that salami. <laughs> How have you ever got away with that? Flip it, like, you know. Everybody you, missed you, that you, one. Yeah. yeah, you go to one convention and every actor is suddenly like, "Oh, the actor said to the bishop, kind of deal." Yeah, and yeah, I just keep. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> one, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and how about you, Mario? So, uh, my website is finally out this week. It's books and lattes. I've also got a um, Facebook page I've where you can that. go and post your books, anything you've been reading, any audio books. Yes. Please go and post them. Ramona, thank you. You've um, been on there as well. I can see. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. And I have been re watching Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Oh, wow. Yeah, one. Absolutely yeah. bloody loving it again. It is amazing. Yeah. I love that silent oh. episode or the op was it a silent episode or well, an opera episode? Yeah. Or yes, yeah. it's so scary, honestly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Which we can congratulate because they're returning for the first time in years on Audible. They're doing the sequel I series. No, and Charisma Carpenter, my Charisma Carpenter, Michael Delia is the slayer in this one. It's so exciting. It's gonna oh. be great. Yeah, I think I think Amber um Benson is like the co-writer as well, so she's in charge of the show. And so Spike. Spike is back, everybody, and I cannot I love wait. Spike. Yes. yes. Yes, Drusilla. And that's why I the, to everybody. <laughs> oh, yes. Oh, yes, with Drusilla, the alternative Romana from Big Finish as well as back, Juliet Landau. <laughs> yeah. Well, talking of books, I've literally just finished the whole set of Ben Aronovich's um, Rivers of London. Oh, yeah. Yes, I've heard of that series. And there's there's loads of Doctor Who nuggets in there. He, he re references Doctor Who all the way through it. Mm -hmm. Um it's quite good to pick it out. I'm always, I'm always reading it and thinking, oh, when's the next Doctor Who snippet coming? And then I think, oh yeah, that's just that's a, that's a Doctor <laughs> Who name he's thrown in there. Uh, which, really? which is funny. Which is funny because only people seem to remember him for remembrance, but it's more than that. Mm -hmm. And today I went to Forbidden Planet, and I the I got the the last Ace patch on the shelf. I was so happy to see that, <laughs> and a Rani badge. I was trying to pick which pin badge that I wear and then I saw Kate O'Mara and I was like oh I've got to have a Kate O'Mara badge oh uh, I've seen one of those I've got a Colin one and he said to me where can I get one of those my house because I happen to have a uh, button maker oh, 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 it, oh, oh do you know what Ramona so can do you an easy shop, Ramona? In charge of doing us a, a podcast pin badge, okay? <laughs> I'll tell you what, send, her the, badge, license, send her the literary license logo and she can make the badges probably. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> can, I, can mine say you are free to do as we tell you? Mm. Okay. <laughs> you must obey. You will... <laughs> obey! <laughs> obey! Yeah. Yeah. There was a cool An Anthony Ainley T-shirt as well, where he has the fangs from Survival. I was <laughs> really, I was really tempted, oh, but I didn't get it. I got a Cyberman T-shirt oh, instead. And the uh, the the, uh, the Evil Dead. We saw the second one, didn't we? Oh the third yeah, one. That, that was, was great. It. Yeah, we watched the Evil Dead. Yeah, yeah. The Evil Dead. So, <laughs> I watched Barbie this week. Oh, classic. That was. Um, I'm a Barbie girl. Yeah. Um, I wasn't sure what to expect, but it was quite funny. <laughs> so it says I returned. The circus is in town. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so right that brings us to the crusades um <laughs> we're gonna skip to the plot and we'll be right back
This is the synopsis for Doctor Who, The Crusades, from 1965. The TARDIS materializes in 12th century Palestine during the time of the Third Crusade. When the first Doctor, Ian Charleston, Barbara Wright, and Vicky emerge, they find themselves in the middle of a Sarsian ambush. In the confusion, Barbara is seized by the Sarsian from behind, while the rest of the TARDIS crew stop the attackers from killing William de Tourne, an associate of Richard the Lionheart. Barbara and William Despru are presented to Selden's brother, Salfadin, by L. Ecker, who mistakenly believes them to be King Richard and his sister, Lady Joanna. While Despru reveals their true identity, L. Ecker is furious before he can act. Selden emerges and is intrigued by Barbara. He invites her to entertain him with her stories at supper. Ian, anxious to rescue Barbara, asks for King's help, but the irritated monarch tells Ian that Barbara can remain with Selden until her death. De Chabu and the doctor are able to convince the king to change his mind. Ian is knighted so that he may serve as an emissary. He is sent to Selden's court to both request the release of De Pru and Barbara, and to offer the hand of the real Lady Joanna in marriage to Sarfedin in order to create peace. This makes Joanna indigent and she refuses her consent. Ian delivers his message to Saladin, and in which Saladin grants Ian leave to search for Barbara. During his search, Ian is attacked by bandits and is knocked out. Abram ties him down with stakes in the hot sun and daubs him with honey, aiming to kill him via scapism. Barbara twice escapes with Alker's capture, hiding out in Almer's harem on the second occasion. Al Kerr tries to find Barbara, but she is hidden by a sympathetic harem girl named Mamina. Ian eventually tracks Abram into untying his feet and overpowers him. Ian convinces the bandit to accompany him to Lida and aim him to in his quest for Barbara. Meanwhile, Akher bursts in and is about to attack Barbara when Heron, a man who aided Barbara with shelter, arrives and fatally stabs him. Ian arrives and helps Heron subdue the guards. Heron is reunited with Manuma, his long-lost daughter, and Barbara and Ian head for the TARDIS. The doctor, who has been avoiding involvement in court politics, attempts to make a break for the TARDIS. He is called by the Earl of Leicester, who thinks the doctor is a spy for Saladin and sends him to death. Ian arrives and, presenting himself as Sir Ian of Jaffa, tells the Earl of Leicester that he will carry out the execution himself. The doctor asks for one last chance to see Jaffa before he dies. The Earl of Leicester agrees, and the Doctor is able to sneak away to the TARDIS and the rest of the crew and leave. And that was the plot synopsis for Doctor Who, The Crusades, which aired from the 27th of March to the 17th of April, 1965. And now back to the show. <laughs> to the Literary Licensed Podcast. Tonight we're reviewing the missing episode of The Crusades, and please don't ask me because I haven't seen it. I don't know. <laughs> I've not I've seen it either. Sorry. Apologies. I just realised within 20 minutes of starting that that, that yeah. some of the episodes are available on a DVD that's been on my shelf in the in the the, uh, the, the Lost archives. in Time collection. Yeah, in his archives. Which I didn't you know? realise. So uh, I'm throwing the floor well, over this one, guys. Yeah, yeah, I haven't. Understood. I haven't seen it. I've only heard the <laughs> audio soundtrack version from Audible. Well, Richard the Lionheart, right? People with with blackface, and Tati Lemko as a dodgy Arab. So <laughs> I yeah. love historical. I love the historical side to it, but like I said, I've not seen it. <laughs> um, I watched it. Currently, there's some good. I watched it twice. Yeah, how do we say it without spoiling for these two? How do you say it? Uh, well, it has a great cast. Good night, everybody. <laughs> five out of five, everyone. <laughs> in, in a nutshell, it's uh, how to or how not to sell a religion. Yeah, right. But it has some wonderful casting. It has the great Julian Glover at the start of his career. It has, um, before he comes back as well, the scour for the Jagger off before he worked on Star Wars and he got his little MBA and appeared on Game of Thrones and you had uh, William Hartnell just lording it up as usual. You've got Maureen O'Brien in a really great story. 
But as you said about like uh, a lot of the inaccuracies of the stuff, I'm so grateful I didn't see the visual side. If I seen people like uh, doing different coloured face, like in the heart and all the I'd be like, what on earth is going on for in this it's night? Just, it just reminds me of talons of Wing Chiang because sometimes I just think, why on earth? What were they thinking? Yeah. You know. Oh, oh, but also the great Jean Marsh, who would appear later as Sarah yes. Kingdom, is also. Apparently, wow. Matt, apparently, I heard that. The yeah, brother and sister combination, they took it a bit too far and they got taken aside and said, look, please, can you not, can you just tone it down a little bit? <laughs> oh, yeah. that Yeah, this nearly ended up as incest galore. Yeah. Julian and uh, Paul Julian and Jean Marsh were getting the brunt end of the stick. It, it wasn't very uh, a fun story for them to work on, but it is a memorable story from, from the behind the scenes. <laughs> 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 but again this is one of the, those instances of uh, how can we do Richard the Lionheart and go absolutely mad but hey it's not as bad as Dalek Master Plan I literally have heard the whole audible thing and uh, Sarah Kingdom Jean Marshall she says uh, about taking her clothes off and then the doctor said we must get out of here this is a madhouse full of Arabs and like who put that in the script she's a bit kinky then isn't she with um, <laughs> Sarah Kingdom <laughs> okay, yeah that's a bit of a creep because a lot of Doctor Who actors were going to be in it or were going to be in Doctor Who at the time as well. Mm. So you had like, um, uh, what's his name? Gabor Baraki was Wang yeah. Lo in Marco Polo. Mm -hmm. And then you had um, Eugene Marsh as well. She came back. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, oh, she was married to Pertwee at this point. She just kind of got married when she was doing the crusade. Mm. <laughs> I know. But in terms of the story of the crusade, I'm very sorry, but nothing retained with me with the story. It's one of those stories I think they've done on a very cheapish type budget. They had great English actors, but it, I couldn't distinct any voices, even on Audible. I watched the recon, and it just felt like it's one of those stories that I would probably need assistance with the animation to appreciate the beauty of the story. But yeah. they've got to tone some bits down for it if they were to animate it. I don't know how they could do that. It seems they were trying to make it more edgier before edge was even a thing for like the Hartnell yeah. era, with like that master plan and the toy maker. It seems like those three are, just, are a bit of troubled productions when they've got like slangs and stuff that you wouldn't associate with like his version of the Doctor. But when I say it's a good story, yeah, the Crusade was fun. I've just got to give it a re listen. But I will say the cast is beautifully done as always it's Maureen and company it's it's felt like a pilot it felt like they were still testing out the crew together but they were completely separate a lot with the story which is making it hard to tell who was who no mm. I know they were younger but I couldn't tell Jean Marsh's voice apart nor Julian's voice and I can only recognize them but yeah I think the, I think the problem with it being a lost story it's a bit, it was a bit damaged the sound quality, so you couldn't hear it correctly. So, if they restored the sound quality, I probably would have appreciated it more. It's right, they uh, re they um, on the second episode, they uh, replaced um, pretty much of the film with telesnaps. That's why, yes. because obviously it's still right. it's still a lost story, yeah. And William Russell re reintroduced it, I think, from the video that I saw on YouTube. That was fantastic. Yeah. I loved that one. That was really good. Ian, yeah. as now, brilliant. Best scene Dang. is Ian getting knighted. <laughs> oh, yes. Ian yeah. the knight, Ian being knighted of Chesterton. But I just still love that it's such a fun dynamic. And I always love, like, in the Hartnell era, that no matter what, even when Hartnell was fluffed with his eyes, he says, come along, Chesterton, come along, Chesterbox. And then he's like, I am Chesterton. How many times must I tell you? Here you go, yeah. Uh, what was your name again? It's like that's what I love about Jonathan! stuff. Like that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> my favorite one is when he calls him Chatterbox. Chatterbox. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but um, even so, it's wonderful. And yeah, I'd say it's a missing story for the Crusade. It um, was it four episodes? I read? I'm trying to remember because I've yeah, heard it. Yes, there was four episodes. I, the lion that the just, that the wheel just, of and the ending is uh was quite agreeable that uh everyone agreed that this should not be uttered again 
<laughs> oh yeah, I, I loved it. You know, see, I remember the ending where they just cleared off and that shock ended to like the child is scaring. Like, see that I love, but the episode just blew pie, blew fast. Um, it was one of those really quick stories that you have to literally take everything in or else you'll miss bits. And I missed virtually nearly everything. I had to keep stopping and going back. It's not it was boring. It was too fast-paced even for a Hartnell story. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, Bernard I had Kane to watch it twice. <laughs> Bernard Kane was in it again. Yeah. He was, it's, where, it's, where, where was he in the last one? He was in another story before, wasn't he? Yes, I think so. But, yeah, Craig, if you get round to it, it's just amazing like that. This is a hard one left to say that. It's sort of like a new Who story where it's so fastly done that it just flows by really quickly. I do like the historical ones. They do a really good job on the historical yeah. ones. Oh, I'm not, I'm not doubting it. Was, I'm not saying it's terrible. I've just got to re-listen to it. I'm just saying it's, it was phenomenal. But it had like a new Who vibe before new Who even existed. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Maybe what it was I, a- I like is that they yeah. did portray Saladin as an honourable man. Mm. That I did I like. Mean, That's what I, I like remember. That. Just like, yes, mm. I remember Saladin. Like the Doctor's relationship with him was quite nice. The costumes look good as well. well they oh, they're look- wonderful. They they, look- they were wonderful, oh, oh, especially. Oh, oh. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> when, when I saw the Reign of Terror, I think this would be really good as an animation as well. I, what you said earlier, Matt. Um, I think it would really do it justice. I think so. It's beautiful. I, from all the pictures I've seen, all the cast have talked highly about it. I think it's a well-regarded Hartman story, but if they cleaned up the sound a bit more, even on the retcons and such, I'd be fine with it. But I think that's why sometimes with the missing episodes, I can't click with them. It's the sound mm. quality is yeah. so disjointing from others. And then when they do the animations, it's perfect. They must clean it up for them. It got kids back into history. That was mm, the great yeah. thing. I, could, I, mean, I remember being at school and would have been educational yeah. as well. Shakespearean, you know, because mm. I mean, there was a lot of references. Because like Glover's it. performance was supposed to be very good as well. Oh, but, he was. So I couldn't, like, that, that's the thing I felt disappointed with. I was looking forward to Glover's performance, but because it went by too quickly, I couldn't appreciate it. So yeah. I'll give it an, I'll give it a go again tomorrow when I'm up to Scotland. Maybe it was just yeah. too much going on in the house, but I think. I bought it separately now. I've had it in the collection stuff for like Crusades, so it's all the lost stories bundled together. Maybe individually it will work on its own. What about ratings for this one? Does anyone know what the rating? Yeah, the ratings I've got here, everybody. Bear with just a minute, as Miranda would say. It was eight, ah, 10.5 for the first one, 8.5 for the second, 9.0 for the third, and 9.5 for the final part. Oh. Yeah. Well, that's what I mean. It's a highly regarded first Doctor story, and I feel disappointed not to have en- embraced some of these. But I will give them another run around. I think because I'm so far ahead with Patrick Trout, and now going back to Hartnell has disjointed it a bit for me. Hmm. Well, David J. Howe said in the Television Companion from 1998, and Stephen James Walker called The Crusade a magnificent story, praising Hartnell's performance in the third episode as one of his best and most intense performances as the Doctor. Wow. Oh, yeah. I, I, anytime I've heard Hartnell through any of these stories, even if I've not gelled with them, he is the best standing out point. You can always tell that he commands every performance he stepped in as the Doctor. I think the Crusade was one of those where it was starting to mellow and the Doctor was just having fun because I remember his gleeful Yoda-type laugh before there was Yoda quite a bit. But he goes, <laughs> which is like, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Every time he does his Yoda, I call it the Yoda laugh because it just reminds me so much every time he does oh, it. He's yeah. like, oh, it's, oh it's splendid. <laughs> <laughs> and, you're like, what? and you're just like, what? Where does this come from? Yeah, a doctor you will be. 
<laughs> he's just like a cackling witch every time he does. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> but on a TV rating wise, for because it's a lost part of history, I'm not going to be cruel to it. I'll give it a re-go, but this is from first experience. It's a some six point five, just based on the not gelling. But I will reevaluate on another time with it. What about the technical merit? Which one? Sorry. The technical merit. On the technicality, I would give it based on the based on the high regard the actors give it. I would give it an eight. I would give it a solid eight from the retcon because it's just too good of a story, and I will reappreciate it on another go. But it was it was lovely to hear the dynamic and the most iconic cast in England were all forming from this early Brilliant. days of Doctor Who. From what you've said, Matthew, I'll give it a nine as I love historical anyway, even though I've not yeah. seen it all. I love the historical side to it, so I give it a nine. Uh, oh, if you love Richard the Lionheart, this is a story for you. Excellent. Another nine it. here. Uh, historical merit and technical merit. And for all of the uh, scenery, costuming, work that they put into it, straight nine. Nine. Mm. That's pretty good. What about you, David? Well, yeah, definitely another nine because I mean I think uh, because it, it reintroduced history to kids who thought history was boring, you know, and uh, not so much Doctor Who with the Yoda cackle, more like Doctor Witch. So I'll give it a nine. <laughs> well, that's salacious crumb from Star Wars. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. Well, that brings us to the end of. Um... <laughs> The Crusades. Yeah, I like how Craig, you're skipping out on like your rating. Oh, <laughs> whoops! Naughty. <laughs> you're going on the naughty step, Professor. Yeah, he's going to put it in oh, later. Shit. Um, <laughs> yeah. you could do it. You're going to do the Camarios, just like <laughs> just based on what you've heard. Um, <laughs> give it a straight nine, and it's I'll nine give it a preliminary seven for because <laughs> I haven't seen it in fully full context, but I'll give it a nine for the historical side. The costumes look amazing. Yeah, a lot of the performances have been really um, it's some classic shit. Admired, yeah. yeah. Um, so oh, I'll and give it some some break. Um, well, I'll give you a side quick note before you wrap. If you want to hear the crusade, like talked so highly regarded by the cast. Phantom films do like these things where it interview the cast for like unofficial commentary. So you can buy from them like Julian Glover and all the cast literally like reviewing the crusade and such if you want to hear unofficial commentary right. or to help the story along. I'll check it that out. Because that might make it easier because if it's missing stories Phantom's commentary will make it easier for you to gel with it like what they went through. Yeah, I'll give it a go. Doctor Who and the Daleks is a 1965 British science fiction film directed by Gordon Fleming and written by Milton Sebusky, and the first of two films based on the British science fiction television series Doctor Who. It stars Peter Cushion as Doctor Who, Roberta Tovey as Susan, Jenny Linden as Barbara, and Roy Castle as Ian. It was followed by Daleks Invasion Earth, 2150 AD in 1966. The story is based on the Doctor Who television serial, The Daleks, produced by the BBC. Filmed in Technicolor, it is the first Doctor Who story to be made in color and in a widescreen format. The film was not intended to form part of the ongoing storylines of the television series. Elements from the program are used, however, such as the various credit characters, the Daleks, and a police box time machine, abate and reimagined forms. What we're going to do is cut to the trailer and be right back. Hello, darling. Hello. It began just as you see here. Do you know what you have just done? You have transferred us in time and space, and I hadn't even set the controls. Now I don't know where we are. We could be anywhere in the universe and at any time. Yes, this is how it began. The adventure that started by accident, taking us out of this time and place to a lost planet. Who's there? Who's there? Come with us into that strange new world. We cannot guarantee your safety. 
that I can promise you unimagined thrills. You have invaded the world of the Daleks. Every move you make, we can see. An alarm bell! They know we've escaped! They're cutting through the door! Come with us to the petrified forest. Meet the Thars, the blonde giants who have survived the monstrous rule of the Daleks. We must get to the city! They could have scanners here, anything. I'm going back. No, you're not! We'll be killed! We'll never defeat the Daleks! We are watching you. We can destroy you. It's a trap! Go back! Run! These are the people trapped by the Daleks. Doctor Who, the brilliant science professor. The young man who triggered off this strange journey. The professor's frightened granddaughter. And the youngster who inherited her grandfather's adventurous spirit. Doctor Who and the Daleks. Now you can see them in color on the big screen, closer than ever before. So close, you can feel their fire. So thrilling, you must be there. Barbara, look behind you! Stop the countdown! The bomb will destroy the planet! Well, me and David saw this. We yes. saw these movies re re restored in 4K at the Phoenix Cinema in East Finchley. We watched them back to back. Um, it was bloody fantastic. Really good it was such yeah. a good. It was so good to see it on the cinema screen. It was amazing the quality. Um, but um, I'll throw the doors open. And what are your opening thoughts, guys? I'll let Ramona go because obviously it's a say ladies first. Okay. Okay. I saw only 35 minutes of it on a uh, streaming service with a voiceover from uh, somebody who was trying to be funny or just trying to get past the um, BBC copyright issues. Um, what I did see of it, I enjoyed um, some, some bits I found very funny. Right off the bat was uh, Barbara grabbing hold of Ian for a kiss right in the machine there and uh, <laughs> flipping the switch and then blaming him. Um, what, did you, what, did you, what did you think of the TARDIS in this one, Ramona? Because the mm. TARDIS was different. Way, way different. Uh, different history on that on the TARDIS. Um, it wasn't Gallifrey in design. Uh, mm. This was a uh, human design or uh human inspired but then uh i have been working on a theory where there was a doctor out there that was trying to recreate his tardis from memory yeah. so it could have been it could have been a rasselonian tardis mm. but it was from memory from a doctor using the uh, chameleon arc to um recapture uh, his memories and uh, uh in this one i love the daleks they uh, the, yeah. the eye stalks the colors um, they were beautiful yeah. yeah the shape i <laughs> wish they'd brought them into the tv series but they never did i don't know why oh um, there's a funny story on that one they actually did these props were used in the chase and they repurposed them for the movie all oh, right because i've so got these daleks are actually on the tv Mm 
Yeah, yeah, these Daleks were used actually in the chase before they went onto the big screen. The only reason they didn't need the flamethrowers in the actual episode because they couldn't practically work it. And they tried again for it for this one, for the film, but that was, again, a hazard, and they were afraid children would be scared by the Daleks shooting flames, so they used fire extinguishers for the fires. Oh, <laughs> so that's why them. they had pressurised air guns. Yeah, yep. it was just fire okay. extinguishers just to make it more visual and cheaper than doing like a ray beam and you see them fall down. And you're like, I like Roy Parks in this. And from, from what we see, have seen that um, in that they uh, survived the shot, that the Daleks can modulate the, their weapons for a stun or a kill shot. Yeah, kind of like the original yeah. episode. It's adapted up, but it's just you actually visually get to see it this time. Mm, it's like they became more ruthless and more, more evil. And mm. at first, it was like anesthesia, but then they they, they they got darker and darker, and you realize that these machines will just try and exterminate you and kill. Mm. Oh, because Ramona hasn't seen it, but it's just incredibly funny. Like the fouls were always seen as the campness within the original episode, which we reviewed. And mm. what on earth did they do to them in this film? They made them more camper than the actual episode it's adapted on. Yeah. True. And uh, wearing sort of a uh, uh, Max Factor eye makeup, which looked quite cool. I, li I, I literally <laughs> thought at one point the, the fouls were literally called like. The fouls in this were literally getting it on with anything because literally compared to the original, they look like screen queens and literally they, they would do virtually anything. Oh, it, it was the blo it was the blonde hair at the eyeliner. It's like they're definitely batting on both sides of the coin on this planet. That's stuck in my mind that you know because uh, I remember seeing it uh, with Craig and and they're re re recapping on that. Was, they look like sort of um, the glam period of it was, music, you know. <laughs> it was produced on a budget of one hundred eighty thousand. Wow, yeah, think, which is probably which is probably more than the actual episodes did. <laughs> <laughs> that was to cost the one Dalek. That was yeah, just one Dalek, yeah. you know. <laughs> yeah, but another tidbit: they stole the actual Dalek voices, David Graham and Roy Scout, and they yeah. stole them oh. from the actual episodes for it. And Bloody I don't know if any of you guys have seen Dalek Mania, the uh, documentary. Um, but they actually <laughs> filmed they they actually filmed it in the Muswell Hill Odeon. Oh bloody hell! Um, yeah. Which is the it's the, it's the local cinema to where I live, um, and it's where the the ticket the box office guy is there, and he's really creepy looking, and he gives out the ticket to the kids. Yeah, um, that was in the Muswell Hill Road, and that's now a an everyman cinema. An everyman, now. Yeah, that's yeah. Change, but it's a lovely cinema. Yeah, beautiful. It's a very really good documentary on the movies as well. I remember. Um, yeah, I I really watched it for the I, first time in ages today on ITV Hub. The 4K remaster must be the version on there, and it's just wonderful. It's by Amazing. Studio Canal, who does all the Hammer horror films. But mm. it was wonderful. That's probably why Peter Cushing was cast in the first place as the Doctor because of that long-standing association he has with that company. With yeah. like, was, I think what was wonderful about it is. Susan stays virtually the same, but she's just a kid. But she's got way more confidence than Carol Ann's version. Um, she's obviously they're human versions, yeah, but it's so they, funny. Uh, why couldn't they use uh, William Hartnell in the movie? It, it's probably for copyright reasons to get around it because right. oh, this film had a lot of red flags apparently from the BBC. I think it was Terry Nation's idea to take Doctor Who to a big screen audience, but I don't think he told him about it either. What he had in mind, I think they wanted the Hartnell crew, but obviously he was unwell at that point. And it made more sense to go in the original route. Yeah, it's funny. I mean, this is an adaptation of that story, but it's more straight to the point and a lot quicker than the Daleks. But it's yeah. like Peter Cushing. Sorry, became like a sort of. He's like a cover version of William Hartnell. You know, mm. in a sense. You know, oh, but... oh yeah. I like the fact he doesn't call him Chastity or whatever. He just says like Harold straight off the bat. He's already getting his <laughs> name wrong. But... <laughs> But I like that uh, he still has that magic of Hartnell in the performance. Yeah. But like, what if the Doctor was human? 
I know I've heard people over the years say they don't like the inside of the TARDIS because it's not like the TV. But that's the point. It's a human building. It. Like, what if a human had the idea to build the TARDIS? Yeah. Oh. It, it, I love the how big of the Dalek City looks. I know some things had to get removed, but of the, all the changes, it's just so funny they made Barbara also the Doctor's granddaughter. Hmm. Oh. Oh, it's so funny. So that Barbara rides, Barbara who, Susan who, Doctor who, it's just so funny that mm. who seems like to be accepted nice and everybody's it. bothered by it. <laughs> what was that Dalek it, we saw in the Warren Street, Craig? What, what movie that was, was that? a Dalek from... Yeah, we saw a Dalek. Um, a real... Doom, Doomsday. Yeah. I've got a Peter Cushing Dalek. Um, yeah. Uh, let, let me just go and grab it. Yeah, we're just, uh, we, we saw a Dalek in Warren Street near uh, Tottenham Court Road. It was a film company, a uh, small film company in that area, and it was just sitting in the window, you know? So we went in and said, could we could we look at it? Like, you know, and the guy said, of course, you know. You can, uh... But you know what? This film was ahead of its time. They basically said this was the first time the reason it did on was the Daleks were in colour before Doctor Who actually was in colour. So it's quite funny to see so the Daleks. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, it's so funny to see the Daleks for the first time in history in colour before they were in colour on the actual show. This is my Dalek from... It's a talking Dalek. From that actual... Um, oh, my gosh, it's Dimensions in Time. It's the floating Cushing head. Yeah. <laughs> yeah brilliant. <laughs> Pick, pickled in time, like Gherkins in... Which Doctor <laughs> are you? I'm Doctor Who. And like, I've never been to. <laughs> out, out. Out. <laughs> <laughs> what was the, does anyone know the uh, the 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 rate the re, the how much profit it made when it was released? Uh, I heard it did quite well in America and England, but I think people were taken back by the movie because obviously Hartnell was ongoing. It was never heard of two versions of the same Doctor being on the same screen at the same time, even though one's human. It's oh. so weird they, they adapted it. Sorry. But I think the Dalek Invasion, like the next one, I found that much more funner because they just didn't do like a straight adaptation on the sequel. But we'll get to it when we cover that one. But I'll mm. say that one. It felt like it was its own thing having fun the second one more than this one. It felt like a direct version for the cinema. Amicus bought the option to make to make the story and two sequels from Terry Nation and the BBC for five hundred squid. I love the dome lights on the Daleks. Mm. I think I know there's a huge copyright issue, or whatever, but I would like it if Studio Canal could get the rights to bring the da those Daleks into New Who. We've had Asylum mm. of the Daleks would have been the perfect place to have dropped them in, like if you wanted yeah. every single Dalek. Those Daleks were, yeah, that's yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Mm. But like uh, Matthew was saying, the uh, first time we saw Daleks in color, yeah, you know, yeah, it was black and white, you know, mm. yeah, great, yeah, because yeah. because yeah. that was around the time of things like the chase. So Vicky and company were on like the small screen with the Daleks, which this came beforehand, which is still black and white, yeah, and this was ahead of like the Pertwee era where the Daleks would first appear in color for the TV series, mm. okay. <laughs> Beautiful. It's just an iconic shape. It's one of the most iconic shapes of like the last century, you know. Mm. Well, I think someone's done an edit. Oh, it's somewhere floating around the internet of uh what's it called? I think somebody's done an edit where the films were in black and white to homage Hartnell, which is a different take of watching the film. But and I think it made it more eerie watching the black and white movie of Doctor Who and the Daleks because it felt more creepy watching that yeah, yeah. than the act the actual colourful <laughs> campiness it came from. Yeah, exactly. But yeah, because something a bit something kind of a little bit sinister and exciting about black and white anyway. You know, all the old film noir. Did I you... think what I loved about this iteration oh, is the first time I... you. I love the iteration of it because it's so fun, especially like the Dalek scene where everyone was wondering how Ian was going to get out of the Dalek dome. Mm. I like the original. They had the rocks and everything to throw on them, but they just had Ian to just get out. And I like the fact the Dalek blew up. Like they just qu they just didn't question it. They just literally exterminated <laughs> it on the spot. It's just, I'd like to go and see it again, actually. 
It was great. I, w- I kind of wish they explored a bit more on the Khalid creature. The Khalid, like, when they got out of the, like, the squid, it was yeah. so nice. Yeah. That was the first time in colour as well, the Daleks out of their casing. Yeah. 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 And you actually saw what was what they actually were, you know. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, because I think in the Daleks, yeah. they alluded to it, but you don't properly see it as well. Mm. Iconic. So what about ratings? Oh, because I, I'm so fond of this movie. The relationship between Barbara and Ian is more like a boyfriend-girlfriend straight off the bat rather than the implied relationship they'd have later. Susan yeah. was so fun in the story, especially when she opened the door and literally Ian flew through it. It's wonderful. It's a <laughs> true piece of cinema history. Yeah. And I really got a soft spot for it. I'd say... It was magical for its time. It's magical now. And it almost got a reference in Day of the Doctor if they got the rights to the posters. So I will give this a solid 10 out of 10. Peter Cushing is a wonderful almost Doctor. And if he was ever casted for the TV series, I think he would have been an even magnificent performer if he got the part. So mm-hmm. like, that was a wonderful insight to him in the role. No yeah. soft centers here for what I did see. Definitely an eight and a half, nine. <laughs> eight and a half, nine. Uh, I, I, no, come on, it's got to be a ten because... It All was right, a, I give it a it ten. It was a moment in history. <laughs> <laughs> it was a moment in history. And, uh, like, uh, you know, like Matthew was saying, we saw the Daleks the first time in colour, and it was just a great... It was just a, it had a real suspense to it. You felt like you are actually there with the Thals when they were going through the forest, you know? Um, and, and when Susan was coming back with the... Uh, the, the medicine, you know, to kill the radio. It it was scary, you know, you really wanted to make it to the, you didn't yeah, think she was that, it, you know, yeah. And that's kind of why I prefer to the original The Daleks and like how they treated actual Susan with Carol Ample. This Susan yeah. had so much confidence, like you wish that that Susan had when you watched the original version. Yeah, you know, because she was still just a little kid, but she was, there was a lot lying on her, um, well, a lot resting on her to get that stuff back, yeah. you know. All the rest and I think now, I don't think that was the perfect... Uh, that was the smart decision. They didn't make her like Caroline Ford. They made yeah. her her own version, and that's what I loved about it. Yeah. Mm. You know, and giving, like, power to kids. Fantastic, you know? Because, you know, it was about kids anyway. Mm. Like, it, they knew the market, the audience was going to be mainly, you know, young young people, like, you know, so... It, felt, mm. it sort of felt like a Gene Wilder movie when I was re-watching <laughs> it. Like, it sort of felt like the Willy Wonka style with, like, all the cast <laughs> getting on. <laughs> Young Dalek. <laughs> yes. Oh gosh, can you imagine it? Like the baby yeah, squid and like small take. <laughs> blazing oh, Dalek. He rolled a blazing Dalek. You know, it'd be great. No, I can't. I can't imagine Davros on the campfire scene now. <laughs> <laughs> With all the beans. <laughs> great. Yeah. No, oh, definitely a ten. It was just, it was great fun. We had a great afternoon at the cinema. Popcorn, Coca Cola, and it didn't it, great. like it was. It was the Daleks, <laughs> and then it was followed by the Daleks invasion Earth twenty one fifty AD. Exactly, yeah. So but you didn't notice the time. Like we what? Like, no, we were there for a good, a good maybe probably four three or five hours, hours or something yeah. like that. But we just yeah. Enjoyed. I know. It, I know. We said an hour and thirty minutes. We watched yeah. it on ITV, but yeah. it felt like thirty minutes. It felt like no time had passed watching it. Again. Yeah, you're right. Mm. You know, it was, it was so enjoyable. You know? And I think it's available on the ITVX player. I think. <laughs> Actually, I'll just say that. <laughs> I wouldn't mind the actual poster now. It's great, isn't it? Look, yeah, the poster's great. I'm gonna give it. I think I'm gonna. I like the. I like the style. It was sleek. The yeah. set design was amazing. The pan. The panning shots when it followed the Daleks on the spaceship. You felt like you were really there. Really there. In the action. Um, Peter Cushing was fantastic. Uh, um, I like the music. Um, yeah, I'll give it a ten. Yeah, yeah, because it was iconic. It was, yeah, it's one of those films in history and that, that set the tone for things. And it's kind, and of, kind of, of and you kind of wish if number two did did as well that they had the third and final Cushion movie. I know there was plans for that, mm. but it didn't happen. 
It was but like a that movement. I did notice was that uh, there was no mention of Davros or, or um, uh, the destiny of the Daleks or Davros or uh, what they did mention was that they wanted to destroy the Thals and completely oh, take uh, over the planet. They had yeah. no universal mm. um, Maybe they were still working on the mythology. So that brings us to the end of the Literary Licence podcast. <laughs> and do you guys have anything you want to plug? Any any blogs or websites? <laughs> What's that? <laughs> Ramona, you've got some you've got some blogs, haven't you guys? Um that are quite cool to to um on your Facebook. Well, um currently uh I've been kind of puttering around lately because I've been packing for moving, but I'm still doing a couple of stories and, and one is a continuation of the Tinned Beef and Bean series. And okay. Sounds cool. that involves the Daleks and uh, the Doctor and uh, a few surprises. Cool. And um, if you wanna, if you wanna join the uh, Ramona and us on Facebook, we have a Facebook page called the Whovians Podcast, um, and there's lots of news, of Doctor Who news, videos, newsletters, uh, articles. Just, just check it out. It's very, very good. Uh, and we're on our 505th member on there, aren't we? So yes. that it's increasing. We have, we have a group. That's the Whovians Podcast. We have 505 members already, and you are welcome to join <laughs> on Facebook. Cool. And David, you've got gig any gigs coming up? At yeah, Lord yeah. The, the, the usual Thursday night at our uh, local pub. Um, Where's and, that? And that's in East Finchley, not too far from the Phoenix, where we saw Doctor Who. But um, been sort of like branching out, trying to sort of, play some other places around London, you know, because the open mic now is kind of taken off. It's a good way for people to sort of like, you know, give them a platform to play who's not been in bands. And you're working on an album, is it? And it's, yes, this is going to be a 15 track or possibly maybe more, I don't know now, but it's um, part of it's going to be recorded in Lincoln with an old mate who's another musician. And then I'm going to do some stuff in London and hopefully Craig and a, a few of the friends are going to come down and, Help us out, you know, with uh, some stuff and that, you know. So, yeah, so that's all going to happen probably next month, end of next month. Mm. So okay. these songs are, yeah, it, the whole the whole thing is about the mystery school, uh, you know, the Elysium back in ancient Greece, the, the history that's been hidden from us. That's mm. where I'm expounding on this stuff, you know. Mm. The paradox of human kind. <laughs> yeah, it's good Hello? Yeah, it's good old paradoxes. Yeah, I, I mean that's that's the human condition. We are a paradox, you know. I mean, yeah. uh, you know, we're we're thrown into this life. It's a lesson. I mean, uh, you get a few curveballs thrown at you. So, you know, the the thing is just to try and roll it. You know, as always. Oh, oh, absolutely. Life is always like a roller coaster. You're up yeah. and down. It's yeah. it's never straightforward. And if it is, it will be boring. And if it was, mm. if it was, the day you're still, born is the day you start to die. <laughs> that's what yeah. that's what Zarathustra. Oh, he's not a politician. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Zarathustra said he said, "The person <laughs> who fears death is already dead." Mm. Mm. Matt, have you got any um, stuff coming up at all, or any, anything online? Yes, as I said, I'm off to Scotland on a holiday for two days. Um, from tomorrow, I'm going up to London. I'm going on the night sleep at the Caledonian one. So I'm off to do the Hogwarts Express. Then I'm back on Friday. Wow. To do oh, that'll be cool. I'm off to do Macbeth on Friday, or the Scottish play. So, so sorry if I've cursed anyone that's doing that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, the Scottish play, yeah. Yes, yeah, so I've also got later in the year, I'm seeing... Eccleston in uh, Christmas Carol. So that's my third iteration. I've seen David Bradley and Aid Atkinson do it now. 
I'm trying to get tickets to see Aquist. I'm sorry, no, Aquist, I've just mentioned him. Tenant. I'm going to try and see Tenant do Shakespeare. We're trying okay. to get tickets for it. So go, go, go. Then I'm off to Australia for a holiday in February to see my sister and do the Hobbit House in New Zealand. Oh, so that's that going to be great. So I'm constantly busy. I don't mean to not be here. It's just I've had days off where I'm just like, I'm ready to go. And then I'm suddenly dragged out to go off and do hundreds of phone calls or dragged off to go and do other things. I seen my friend, um, Tiandra Nelson, who was Darth Vader yesterday while we were at the con um, in Harbour. And basically, uh, he's casted me for an audio project. So I can't say much about it yet. <laughs> but David Goodness was like, Oh, is this the thing that I'm doing? No, it's a separate thing, David. But no, I, so it's constant work behind the scenes. I'm celebrating the 60th this year. It's going to be a joy. It's two months to go. Um, also, happy 40th, Return of the Jedi, to all the people out there who are celebrating some, that film of Star Wars. So, yeah, it's a big year. It's been quite busy. Life's just exciting at the minute. And it's not it's not dull because if it was dull, I'd want you to get me a tranquilizer and put me down. <laughs> well, we look, we definitely look forward to seeing the pictures and yeah, the videos. Yeah, yeah, take loads of pictures yeah, of the Hobbit really cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. We're, yeah. we're taking the Hobbits to Isengard. Oh, and that's the video. <laughs> 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 Who'd ever heard of foot in a wheelie of hard girl? Peter Cushing slash hybrid, you get about hobbits. <laughs> <laughs> Sylvester McCoy called it said, as long as you don't mention Sebastian the Hedgehog, that damn hedgehog upstaged me. <laughs> <laughs> oh god. And, uh, and um for myself, I'm going to be, um, I've, I've got some artwork on Etsy, so you can search Etsy shop Craig's World and you can check out some of my stuff on there. And um, obviously, and I'm also posting regularly to the Whovians podcast um, Facebook page, so check that out as well. And, and it's free to join, so if you want to keep up to date, then join our Whovians podcast Facebook group. Okay, so it's good night from East Finchley, mm -hmm. good me night. and David. Yeah. Good night uh, from Hartford, Connecticut. Good night. Ramona. Good night. Good night.